Hi everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to talk about the four books that I read in the month of May. Starting with Jules Verne, Robur le Conquérant. So this, the English translation is Robur the Conqueror. And I had mentioned in the April Reads video that Jules Verne is very much a comfort read for me. He's an author that I like to read when I need something easy, laid back, a little bit fantastical, with full of adventure. And so when I read the Les Indes Noir and back in April, I kind of wanted to continue that mood. But unfortunately, this actually killed my reading mood a little bit. It slowed me down a bit. Just this slim volume of 244 pages, it took almost two weeks to read this. And why was that? It was because the characters were so detestable. And typically I don't have anything against unlikable characters, but these were really, really just detestable. There was no uh, intrigue into their characters. Even if they were unlikable, typically if a character has intrigue and mystery and you want to know more about them, and you want to know why their personality is the way it is, then it can be interesting. But here we just didn't get any of that. So what is the story? Basically you have a president and a secretary of a society who are trying to create or try to build um, a new dirigible style aircraft to go into the air. And they're convinced that for man to be able to conquer the air, the craft has to be lighter than air. So basically full of gas, just like a dirigible. And this man, Robio, he comes into um, a, a sort of meeting in the society that these, the president and secretary of are head of. And he comes in and goes, I have already built, you know, this craft. It actually requires a craft to be heavier than air. And let me prove to you. But, you know, the society, they get all... Um, they're, they're all, who is this? Who are you? And they kick him out. So Robu, that evening, he kidnaps the president and the secretary. And he kids, kids and snaps it into his uh, aircraft that he's created. And it's, he takes them on a trip. It's not even an, an adventure. It's just a trip around the world. And the, the entire time, the two characters are just you know, griping and whining and, you know, we were kidnapped, let's escape, da, 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 da. but there's, there's just no whimsy. And I, and I do think that part of that was the, with the fact that what makes Jules Verne so much fun to read is that he takes you to lands that don't exist or that would be very difficult to visit. And I think because now in modern society we have airplanes and most people have seen the world from above, I think that sense of, um, newness is gone when you read this in present day. Another thing that I really disliked is that um, there was one black character in the book who he was the, the servant to the president of the society and he also got kidnapped along with them but his, his presence was just there to sort of mock um, the aspect of being black and Jules Verne has had black characters before but this is the first time I've seen him so so mean and so cruel to them and it was very unnecessary i just uh, I, I didn't really like this one so this 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 got me stuck so um instead while washing the dishes i was like all right i need to do something totally different i need to read something entirely different so i went for non-fiction so i went for this it's called debal et de lupium which translates to bullets and opium and that's actually the title of the english translation and as you can maybe guess from the cover, it's about uh, the Tiananmen Square. So this is a nonfiction about Tiananmen Square. And basically, uh, Liao Yi Wu, and that's not the Chinese, actual Chinese pronunciation. Um, I don't really know how Pinyin is supposed to, how Pinyin is um, pr pronounced, because I've never studied Chinese, but we'll just go with what's written, even though I know it's wrong. Um, Liao Yi Wu was uh, arrested during the Tiananmen Square for having written a poem about the massacre. And he goes and decides to interview other people who had been imprisoned um, just like him. So it's a series of interviews with people. And it's, it's rough. It's, 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 it's a tough read. I mean, 
you you read all about the Chinese government, you read about these uh, people who were imprisoned five, seven, ten, twenty years for almost fairly minor infractions, but because those infractions were seen as, you know, rebelling against the Chinese government, they were imprisoned for a long time. And the thing about this book is that not only do they talk about the time during the imprisonment, but they talk about the aftermath when they were, these people were released from prison, how they were always seen as enemies of the of the state, how they were always, uh, you know, under how they were under constant surveillance, uh, how any sort of minor infraction would be uh, would have them sent right back to prison for another three, five, seven years, and it just it was absolutely heartbreaking and terrifying. And it was just this, it's, it's just horrible. I mean, it's, it, there's nothing you can say about it. Um, I mean, in terms of a book and how it's written, it, yes, it does get a little repetitive towards the end, but I think that repetitiveness is necessary to show that Tiananmen Square was not the fantasy of one man. It's, it was a real event experienced by multiple people. And the repetitiveness in terms of how each prisoner sort of um, builds their story up, uh, on top of what other pr prisoners, former prisoners, have said, shows that the experience was mutual, the abuse was mutual, and the uh, sort of anti-justice of it was mutual. So it's, I mean, it's horrible to read. I mean, Liao Li Wu. I mean. The number of times he got rearrested by police and he was spied on and you know he's a writer and he's had manuscripts almost nearly completed uh, manuscripts stolen and taken away from him numerous times and he was brave enough to you know continue to write these manuscripts it was very important for him for the outside world to know what had happened on that day and that for this moment of history to not be forgotten um, so this is incredible, very incredible to read. Um, I mean, I, I personally really enjoy reading these sort of first-hand accounts of historical events. And so this was, I mean, if you're into these kind of books, I would definitely recommend this. And French cover, oh my goodness, I can't get over this. Um, if maybe, however, if maybe a actual very historical um, non-fiction account isn't up to, you know, your interests, a recommendation I can give is Hong Kong's Human Acts. Um, you'll recognize her from The Vegetarian, probably. Um, I didn't like The Vegetarian at all, but that's a different story. But this, this was excellent. And this is about uh, the Gwangju Revolution in Korea in 1989. Uh, sorry, Tiananmen Square was in 1989. The Korean um, Student Rebellion was in 1980. So it was a similar experience. And this is a fictionalized account of that. And I think these books, both this fiction form and the non-fiction form of the Korean, uh, of the Chinese book, are very important books to read to just show, you know, people, you know, working against the, the government. It shows how protests can very quickly become uh, violent, which is very important in current day with the situation with um, Black Lives Matter. And then uh, with the Hong Kong riots, especially Tiananmen Square, with the Hong Kong protests, it's all very still, you know, a modern issue, a modern problem. So these books are very good to read to get insight on that. And when it comes to events like Tiananmen Square, it's very important that we keep the memory of those events alive, not only outside of the country, but within the country. So that was very good. The third book I read was uh, Drive Your Plow, your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, which is by the um, Polish author Olga Tokarczuk, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, she won the Nobel Prize in Literature, and this is the first book I've read by her. And I really enjoyed this. But I really enjoyed this in the sense that the reading experience was very pleasurable. It was very page-turning. However, am I going to remember this book a few years down the line? I'm not sure. But at the moment of reading it, I enjoyed it. So this book is about a woman who was a, formerly an engineer and she sort of retired to a very recluse life in a small town in the forest of in Poland. And she is kind of known as having sort of um, 
almost hysterical type of personality. She's very much into astrology. She um, insists that she can read the future of people's lives via astrology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so one day, when a uh, her neighbor is seems to have been murdered um, in the middle of the winter in this Polish town, um, she sort of takes you through the reasons why maybe he could have been murdered. And as more bodies turn up, she starts to bring out this theory that animals are killing these people as revenge for the cruelty that the animals have been inflicted, have had inflicted on them from hunting and um, from sort of those sort of uh, uh, events within the town. So there's a connection between the people who are being killed and the uh, main character insists that she knows who killed those people, it was the animals in the forest. So there's a lot of story, it's a very almost fairy tale like uh, writing, which I was, I was the part that I found very, very uh, enjoyable. I really liked that eerie fairy tale-esque um, style that really brought out the winter cold of a Polish um, town, but also that shows sort of the beauty of that. Um, so this was, I like this, but I think it's a book that you need to read yourself to see if you like it. But in general, I mean, this has been well received <clears throat> and I, I would recommend that you try and read this if this is up your alley, because this is very, it's, it's good. I really enjoyed myself. The last book I read and my favorite of the month was Larry McMurtry's Dead Man's Walk. So Larry McMurtry is most famous for Lonesome Dove. Very thick, very famous book. And I read this last year and it immediately became my favorite book of the year and it became basically one of my favorite books of all time. It was absolutely stunning. It was beautiful. It's what I would call the perfect novel. Why is it the perfect novel? Because it just the ability to show humanity both in its uh, beauty and its cruelty and the way Larry McMurtry compares that to the the cruelty and beauty of nature in the old American West and that story was just oh my gosh when I read this I just could not I mean I'd be at work and I brought this to work with me every single day. I mean, it's huge, but I brought this because I was just, you know, while I was working, I was constantly thinking, when can I read this next? When can I start reading it again? When can I pick it up? I would come home and I wouldn't eat dinner. I would immediately start reading. I was so engrossed in this book. It is beautiful. It's just, I mean, ugh. So immediately after I finished reading this, um, I had bought the other books in the series. So Lonesome Dove was actually written first and then he went back and wrote a sequel to Lonesome Dove and then he wrote a prequel, two prequels to Lonesome Dove. And this is a prequel. So this is technically the first book in the Tetralogy, but it's not the first book that was published. And this was fun. Also page turning. I love the fact that we go back to the two main characters that we love and adore from Lonesome Dove and see their backstory. And especially knowing um, what awaits them in the future really, really made it almost more heartfelt, more, more endearing. Especially because this book is a lot less lyrical than Lonesome Dove. It's definitely more of an adventure. So what is this about? It's about um, Gus and Call, the two, the two main characters from Lonesome Dove, and when they were young and when they first become uh, rangers, Texas rangers. And Texas rangers typically will um, guard the border between Texas and Mexico. And at that time, they were also um, very often hired to find new routes to different towns in, within Texas and New Mexico and the rest of the American West. So Augustus um, and Call, or Gus and Call, they are basically hired to take a trip to New Mexico. And so on this journey, you know, they, they have, they're with, they start off with 200 other soldiers and men. And little by little, as they encounter, you know, bad weather, as they encounter Comanche Indians, as they encounter 
um, the Mexican army as they encountered the Apache Indians, little by little, those those 200 people, uh, you know, they're killed, they're maimed, they're tortured, they're, it's, it, it's cruel, it's brutal. I mean, it's, it's the American West. And um, it was, I had so much fun reading this. And again, I read this in just a few days. It's 450 pages, and it didn't even take a week to read this. This was so much fun. Um, if you're wondering if, if you're interested in the Lonesome Dove, Dove Tetralogy, and you're wondering if you should read it in chronological order or publication order, I think I would recommend going with public, publication order and starting with Lonesome Dove. Because Lonesome Dove is just, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And I think starting with that and then going back adds a very fun perspective that you wouldn't have if you're trying to start from, say, uh, Dead, Dead Man's Walk, which is the first book. So those are the four books that I read in May. So here they are, yay. And um, I had fun with that and I'm looking forward to see what June brings. Um, right now I am reading uh, The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin, which is a uh, science fiction. Um, enjoying it and I'm excited to tell you guys all about it in my June wrap up. All right, thanks for watching, bye.